uh, Bible prophecy. We do this every Sunday morning. We set aside a portion of our Sunday morning service to look at what the Bible says about the last days. We believe that we're living in the last days and that the return of the Lord for his church is drawing nigh even at the door. Well, 10 years ago today, we all witnessed the unspeakable evil of Islam and what some believe signaled the beginning of the end of the world. And since 9-11, we've seen this rapid escalation of geopolitical events, the likes of which no generation in the history of mankind has ever seen. Now, at the risk of sounding hyper-sensational, let me say this. September 11th, 2001, commenced a countdown of sorts, swiftly fulfilling Bible prophecy concerning, namely, the prophecy about the rapture of the church. Excuse me. In Revelation 12.12, 12, we're told that the devil is filled with fury. Why? Because he knows he hath but a short time. And it's for this reason that we see Satan sort of ramping things up. And this explains why it is that unthinkable evil is waxing worse seemingly by the day. Now, I've said this before, perhaps I need to say it again, but I hope that you don't have this notion that things are going to get better. Do you? I hope not, because the Bible prophesies that in the last days it will become so evil and it will get worse seemingly by the day prior to the return of the Lord. Now, I know that that doesn't win friends and influence people when a pastor says, hey, it's going to get really bad. Have a nice day. Have a nice week. But it's true. It's going to get worse because the Bible says it will get worse and see Satan, though not omniscient or all-knowing, does know that time is short. In fact, I believe he knows what many Christians today don't know, and that is that there's not much time. Now, Ephesians 6.12, the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Ephesus says that our war isn't against people, flesh and blood. This isn't a war or a battle or a struggle against the Arab people or the Muslim people. This is a war against rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This is a satanic spiritual war. And I'm of the belief that the intensity and the enormity of these forces of evil authenticates and validates that the rapture of the church is imminent. Maybe I can say it this way. The events of 9-11, 10 years ago, sort of sped up the return of the Lord. The clock started ticking, if you will. Now, in our prophecy update back on July 17th, we looked at the prophetic significance of several things taking place during this month of September. It's going to be an interesting month. It's already sort of starting off that way and more yet to come. Stay tuned. Since then, I've sensed that the Holy Spirit was impressing upon my heart the urgent need to ready and steady the Bride of Christ for the return of Christ. 
in the event the Bible calls the rapture, harpazo, rapturus, the catching up, the snatching away of the church prior to the seven-year tribulation. Now, I probably speak for you when I share this, but 9-11 is such a hard day, isn't it? Such a hard time because we relive the horrific events of that day. And to me, as an Arab who's a believer in Jesus Christ, it comes packaged with a profound opportunity to get as many people out of the burning building of this world because it's going down very fast to get as many people saved as possible before it's too late. This is why for the last seven weeks we've been doing this study not just on the pre-tribulation rapture but why it is that it must happen before the seven-year tribulation and in so doing why it matters that we believe that and know that. And on this, the 10th anniversary of 9-11, I can't think of a more apropos reason for a pre-tribulation rapture than part six of our seven-letter acronym, the responsibility on us. We took the seven letters in the word rapture and created seven reasons why the rapture has to happen before the seven-year tribulation. It just so happens that today on 9-11, in 2011, the responsibility, the R in our rapture acronym, the responsibility on us is a perfect fit for purposes of our understanding. Now, I want to invite you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew, the 25th chapter. Matthew 25, and we'll look at verses 1 through 13. Jesus is teaching one of several parables, really three parables, as we'll see in a moment. And he says in verse 1, Matthew 25, at that time... The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom, verse 5, was a long time in coming. And they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom! Come out to meet him! Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But... While they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the, watch this, wedding banquet. And the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Sir, sir, Lord, Lord, they said. Open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth. I don't know you. Therefore, verse 13, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Well, this parable of the ten virgins has been the subject of much debate amongst Bible teachers and one for which there are basically two schools of thought. Some believe that the ten virgins represents those professing to be Christians in the church, thinking they're saved when they're really not, and thus they miss the rapture. Yet others 
in the other camp believe the ten virgins represent Israel and not the church, chiefly because the oil can't be representative of the Holy Spirit if the virgins could go out and purchase it. The Holy Spirit sealing us for our redemption cannot be bought. It is given. So they, among other arguments, say, and they're compelling arguments on really both sides of the table, but they say that because the groom, when he comes, they go to not the wedding, but the wedding banquet. So there are some good arguments for that case, for it being Israel and not the church. But then, on the other side of the table, there's also good arguments for it being representative of those who believe they're Christians. I'm of the belief that both interpretations, <coughs> pardon me, teach a pre-tribulation rapture. <coughs> pardon me. Now, here's how I get there. Whether Jesus is speaking about the church or about Israel, or both, by the way, the teaching of the parable speaks to their ability to respond. Now, stay with me. The five virgins who were wise had the responsibility to take oil in their jars along with their lamps and... Then they went out to meet the bridegroom. Conversely, the five foolish virgins, though taking their lamps as well, did not take any oil with them when the time came for the midnight cry that the groom is here, come out to meet him. Now it's interesting to note that Jesus says all the virgins became drowsy and fell asleep. <coughs> not just the five foolish ones. They all did. Why? <coughs> Pardon me. Because we're told that the bridegroom was a long... Just excuse me a second here. Boy. <coughs> <coughs> My precious four-year-old daughter shared with me her cough. <laughs> In Jesus' name. <laughs> So what am I going to say? <laughs> the bridegroom was taking a long time in coming, which is why all ten of them fell asleep. When the bridegroom comes, we're told that all of them woke up. All of them trimmed their lamps. But the foolish ones asked <coughs> the wise ones for some of their oil because, interestingly, their lamps were going out. There's an interesting detail here, and it's interesting for a number of reasons, not the least of which is it implies that they had some oil at one time. Because they say our, our lamps are running out. Oh, thank you. I'll take that too. Oh, it's cold. Yeah, I like the colder. <laughs> Now, this is very key to our understanding. It's germane to our knowing what Jesus is teaching in this parable. Here's why. What little oil they had at one time was now running out by the time the bridegroom did indeed return. This fits with the bridegroom seemingly delaying his coming, which is why it led to the sleepiness and the laziness of all ten virgins. However, only five were wise. When the midnight cry came, they were saved by virtue of how they responded. How did they respond? They responded by taking oil with their lamps. And the determining factor in their salvation was that they had the responsibility to take that oil, whereas the other five did not. Why? So they wouldn't run out when the time came. Okay. 
the contrast between these five wise virgins and these five foolish virgins is striking in how the foolish ones didn't take the responsibility, ability to respond, if you prefer, and take more oil with them. Why would they not take more oil with them like the five wise virgins did? Here's a thought. Because they thought they had more time. No hurry, no worry. And it's evidenced when the wise virgins refuse to give them some of their oil in fear of there not being enough oil, and they tell them, you better go out to those who sell the oil and get oil before it's too late. So they leave, they go, they get the oil, and by the time they come back, it's too late. They thought they still had time. And we're told that these five foolish virgins later also came and said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he tells them, I do not know you. It's reminiscent of Matthew 7, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Interesting word in the original language of the New Testament. Now, it's what Jesus says next that's so chilling. He says to them, therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. This is in keeping with the theme of the two other parables like bookends on both sides of this parable. There's a common denominator in all three of these parables, and it's the responsibility or ability to respond on the part of the ones who were wise in contrast to the ones who were foolish or wicked. We have three parables with the bridesmaids or the virgins being the one in the middle. The parable before it is about two servants, and it's found in the previous chapter in Matthew 24, 32 through 51. Here, Jesus teaches this parable contrasting the righteous servant and the wicked servant. And in terms of their ability, the playing field of servanthood was level, but their responses were very different. The response of the wise servant was that he took the responsibility upon himself to be watching and ready, for he knew not what day or hour his master would return. And when his master did return, he found this faithful servant doing what his master had called him and commanded him to do. And he would respond to him and say to him, well done, good and faithful servant, enter in. Now this is contrasted in the parable with the response of the foolish servant, what was his response? Well, he thought he had plenty of time. My master delays his coming. And his response was to live irresponsibly, partying and living a rowdy life. Got plenty of time. My master delays his coming. And then, after this parable, Jesus then teaches the parable of the ten virgins that we just read. Contrasting the wise with the foolish. And in terms of their ability, the playing field of salvation was level. But their responses were very different. They all ten had lamps. They all ten had oil. But the response of the wise virgins was that they took the responsibility upon themselves to take enough oil with their lamps. Conversely, the response of the foolish virgins thinking they still had time. Why? Because the bridegroom was delaying his coming. They became drowsy and sleepy because he delayed his coming, and their response was to live irresponsibly, not taking enough oil when the time came. Then the parable after that, the parable of the talents, as it's called, in chapter 25, verses 14 through 30, Jesus contrasts the stewards. And this time, he again levels the playing field. And it, we're told, interesting detail, he gives them the talents, each according to their ability. I'm not the, 
I know you know this by now. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, the brightest bulb in the pack, the whatever you want to, you know. As it's been said, I'm one, you know, fry short of a happy meal, however you want to describe it. <laughs> but... <laughs> It's that self-deprecating humor that is good, you know. But the word responsibility means ability to respond. I know that's deep, but <laughs> responsibility, ability to respond. And these are, stewards are given according to their ability ability to respond to what their owner was giving them, each according to their own ability. Now, what's the response of the wise stewards? They took the responsibility to invest what they were given in the time that they were given and doubled that which the owner had given them in terms of, their, of his property. But then there's that wicked steward. And because we're told, again, the owner was taking a long time in coming, his response was to foolishly and fearfully hide his talent in the ground. All three parables, three different parables, all teaching the same thing. Okay, pastor, how do these parables drive a death nail into the coffin of the opposing views? The pre-wrath view, the mid-trib view, the post-trib view. Well, I'm so glad you asked. If the rapture happens at any time other than before the seven-year tribulation, then these servants, these virgins... These stewards will respond differently. Instead of the foolish virgin being caught off guard, she's on guard. Things are going down. Something's up. So, and because the clock has already started ticking, she'll respond accordingly by getting the oil now before it's too late. Because now I can sort of calculate the day or the hour. They just rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. Oh, my goodness. Wasn't there something about that in Daniel 9, 27, I think? Oh, my goodness, there's a, a, a peace agreement that's been confirmed. And all of a sudden now things are happening. Things are starting to go down. So I'm on guard, and my response is differently as a result. Instead of the foolish servant thinking he's got time to party and time to beat his fellow servants and live a rowdy and radical life because his master delays, all of a sudden now, hey, things are going down. Something's up. So his response is different as well. He's on guard, and he's getting his, boy, I better get my act together. I better... Start getting serious now. The, par the party's over now. There's not much time now. And how about the foolish steward thinking the owner won't return for a long time? He delays his coming. I got time. I'm just going to bury it here in the ground. Now he's taking personal responsibility to do something with that which he's been giving, given before it's too late. And that's why these parables can only fit a pre-tribulation rapture. This is why the timing of this part of our pre-tribulation rapture study is so apropos. Here in the U.S., we did not know the day or hour that this evil attack would come. Now think this through with me. Had we known it would come on that day, at that hour, on Tuesday, September 11th, then what would have been our response? We would have done something. Perhaps for some of us, we would have done 
a lot of things <laughs> differently. We would have gotten our affairs in order because things are going down. Something's up. It came in an hour that we expected it not, and that's why it caught us off guard. We weren't keeping watch. We weren't ready. On the other hand, had we responded by keeping watch, we would have taken the responsibility to have oil with our lamps, if you will, so that we were ready. That, my dear church, is the clarion call. That, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, is the midnight cry. Wake up. Wake up. Get your oil. Trim your lamps. Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. I'll close this way. I believe that the rapture of the church is at the door. It could happen at any time. Do you have oil? Are you watching? Are you ready? So that when, not if, it does happen and it could happen, it won't be for you as a thief in the night because you're ready. Think about this. Can you imagine how freaky it would be if you got a call this afternoon when you got home and there's a voice on the other end of the phone saying, Hey, uh, I'm a thief. And um, I'm going to come and steal. I'm going to break into your house and steal from you. And... Um, I was just wondering, I, I just needed to set up a time with you. Is 2 a.m. a good time for you? Is that a, is that a good, between two, the hour of 2 and 3? Uh, what? You would be ready. You would have the FBI, the CIA, the PLO, whoever else, waiting by the house, by the door. Oh, yeah, bring it. Come on. <laughs> One fifty-nine a.m. You're ready. But his return for us as his bride will come that way as a thief in the night at an hour we do not expect. And he will snatch us away. And that's why we always have to be watching and ready. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you. On this somber day, we do pray, first, that the Holy Spirit would be the comforter in the hearts of so many for whom this day had a horrible impact. Lord, we would just ask that today's commemoration would also be a reminder of the brevity of this life, that it might turn those to you to receive salvation for eternal life. Lord, if there's someone here today that is not ready, would you move in their hearts, speak to their hearts in such a way that they would not leave here today the same way they came. Thank you, Lord. Maranatha. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen.